Hello, hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to What's Working Now, where we talk about business, we talk about marketing, and we talk about life. And because of that, this is why I'm so excited to talk to our guest that we have today, Miss Annie Grace. Annie, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Katie. It's so great to be here. Annie, I am super excited to talk to you. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I have never in my life consumed alcohol. And yet, like, while that is the focus of your message and your conversation, I want to start out by letting anybody know if you have any habit in your life, be it chocolate or not exercising enough, like if there's any habit in your life that you're feeling like this is not serving me and I've tried so many things to change it, Annie is here to share with you some really amazing insights and principles on how to not just make yourself do the things that you want to do or need to do, but like do it in a way that, in fact, Mike Schmidt, he just described it really well. He's like, you know when you watch a really good documentary and at the end you're like super motivated to go make some better decisions or go change the world and, and he was saying like, that's what Annie does for people. So Annie, tell us just kind of in a nutshell who you are and what it is that you do for the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my journey ironically really started out um, in marketing but in corporate marketing. And I grew up in a in an alternative situation. I actually grew up in a very tiny one room log cabin on the backside of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. We had no running water, no electricity. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Not part of your story. Keep going. We had a snowmobile to get there in the winter because it was on the backside of a mountain. Wow. So it was about 10,500 feet in elevation. And um, my parents didn't drink at all. Like there was no, no okay. cautionary tale, no real alcohol in the house. It was, you know, just not really part of part of my life or part of my upbringing. Yeah. But then I graduated with a degree in marketing from CSU in Colorado, and I ended up moving to Manhattan. And wow. uh, pretty much, I was 26 years old, newly married, living in the city, and about. Um, I'd say weeks into this job, my boss took me aside and basically said, hey, you know, why aren't you showing up at happy hour? And I was like, well, I mean, I don't really drink. And he's like, oh, no, 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 it's it's not about drinking. It's about networking. It's where our ideas are shared. It's where the deals are done. Like, you got to show up. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And um, the thing was, Kitty, is that I was so passionate about my job and I didn't, again, have any sort of con cautionary tale about alcohol. So I was like, all right, I'll be there, I'll show up. And I even had this method and it was a glass of wine and then a glass of water and a glass of wine and then a glass of water to make sure that I could keep up with all my colleagues and wow. that I'd be you know, in it. And um, fast forward a decade and it's interesting with alcohol because I feel like, uh, you know, it, it quote, benefits that it it numbs your brain temporarily. So your thoughts, you actually start thinking slower. When you're going a million miles an hour, that can feel really nice. It can feel like relaxation. It raises relaxation. And so I remember, I don't remember any specific point in time, but I do remember that after um, a while, you know, things would happen like instead of going to put on my running shoes and going for a run, I'd get home and be like, oh, I could just pour a glass of wine. And so all of the things that I kind of had done to, you know, just maintain sanity uh, kind of got replaced by alcohol. And so fast forward 10 years, I was actually living in London at the time, had been promoted a lot of times. I was in charge of 22 countries, global head of marketing, and I was drinking, you know, far more than I ever anticipated. And by the way, it wasn't working anymore uh, wow. because my tolerance was so high. So the benefit that I thought that I had really gotten from alcohol okay. just no longer did anything for me. So I was in this situation where I was like, okay, this isn't this isn't fun. Um, I'm yeah. definitely feeling the hangovers. There was never any sort of really bad moments, but it was just kind of this cumulative unease with sort of where I was with alcohol. And yeah. um, so what happened in my life is that I decided that, okay, I want to do something about this. And I was like, all right, I'm just not going to drink on the weekend, only on the weekends, or I'm not going to drink, you know, more than two glasses. Of yeah. wine. And I could do it, but I felt really deprived when I did. I felt like, oh, I'm missing out. And um, at the same time, I'd been going through some really intense back pain, like just physical pain. Okay. And nothing was working. And it was basically three years of me trying all sorts of different things and nothing was working and 
try this stuff, try that stuff. Finally, somebody recommended this book called Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. And the beginning okay. of this book, he's like, okay, so what, uh, what can happen is that you can have thoughts that are really nasty and negative and not congruent with who you see yourself to be in the world. And your body will protect yourself from like those thoughts surfacing yeah. into your conscious awareness. Yeah through pain, it's a distraction. So if you have this young baby that won't stop crying, I had two young kids at the time, I've now have three, and um, and you're like, oh, I hate this, I hate being a mom. You're not gonna think that consciously, but that will surface and part of your body will be like, no, 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 that's not, that's not okay. That's not in line with who you are. And so it can, uh, you know, distract you with pain from thinking those really nasty thoughts. Wow. And so I was like, okay, like, and he goes on to say, well, you know, you could be really skeptical of this, but here's the thing is I don't need to convince your conscious mind. I need to convince your subconscious mind. And to do that, you've got to read this 300 page book. And at the end, your pain will be healed, right? Wow. <laughs> okay. Wait, I'm sharing this story. Like, can I just invite anybody who's watching this right now, share this right now, because your story is so powerful. And it, like, I just, I want to make sure that People who need this message are hearing it. So if you're watching this right now or even watching on the replay, click share and share this message so that Annie can continue to share this story and change people's lives. So keep going. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so then I read the book and sure enough, like my back pain went away and I was like, oh my gosh. And so yeah. I found a theory that, yeah, it was crazy. It was the first time in my life where I really realized the power of the mind. Mm. And um, and I went on to form this theory that the same thing was happening with my drinking, that consciously I wanted to be drinking less, but my subconscious mind, this lifetime of subconscious conditioning now around yeah. alcohol being a relaxant, alcohol being good for, you know, fun, even, you know, good for, you know, loosening up in the bedroom, whatever it was, this lifetime even of good for business, like your boss was saying. Exactly. Like it was so important. Yeah. And so when I wanted to consciously stop drinking, my subconscious just hadn't gotten the memo. And there was this, this really intense inner conflict around it. And so I said, well, what if I could change that? What if I could change the subconscious mind? What if I could make it so that um, it, it, it became aligned again? And I actually got in touch with uh, Dr. Sarno. I was put in touch with somebody on his team named Steve Ozanich. And he got on the phone with me. He's like, yes, Dr. Sarno always said this would work for addiction. It's the same mechanisms mm -hmm. that kind of put me on the path to researching this, to trying to understand it. And about 13 months later, I walked out of my office and I told my husband, I was like, if you want to drink with me tonight's the night, after tonight I'm not drinking anymore. And he was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, it was crazy. Wow. Uh, we wow. sold a bottle of wine and that was it. And that was like almost... Um, almost five years ago now. And so it's been really crazy. And I took all the journals that I had uh, about this whole process for myself and I just put them out. I figured out how to put out a website. I did not, by the way, know how to get email addresses or opt-ins. So I put a PDF on a website somewhere, which was hilarious, but I could see how many people downloaded it. And um, 20,000 people downloaded it in the first two weeks. And I started getting letters from like all over the world, like, you know, this helped me. This was incredible. This was so powerful. And so I was like, okay, I need to. And and I got another letter that was like, and you need to get people's email addresses. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and they're like, well, what if you want to tell them that you did something else? So I was like, oh, okay. So I started getting email addresses and building my list, which was very funny because um, I just didn't know what I didn't know. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. And um, so then I self-published The Naked Mind. And after about, in the first year, it sold about 65,000 copies, which was enough copies to start to get the attention of really the big five publishers. And it actually went to an auction among all, all five of them and was ultimately picked up by Penguin Random House um, last October. And Rich, so I said- Rich, congrats. How did you even sell the first 65? Because I mean, that's a huge feat for anyone who's ever tried self-publishing. What was the main, platform that people were finding you and buying it from? So I started blogging really consistently. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that was important. And yeah. I think the other thing that I did is I really uh, joined a lot of different, and I was actually in them organically myself, but just different groups of people looking for habit change online, you know, and, and really specifically even alcohol. And I'd start, I just started really organically answering questions and being there and, um, you know, not even knowing what I was doing, I guess, making a name for myself a bit. 
And then I think also the key, Katie, was that I gave away the PDF of the entire book on my website. And a lot of people have a lot of fear about that because they think, oh. well, you know, if I'm giving it away, I can't sell it. Even my husband, he's like, oh, gosh, you're going to bro, you're going to, you know, make us broke by doing this. But the truth is that the more books I gave away, the more books I sold. And I think if you have something that's actually really good, yeah. what you want to do is give it away. There's a great story about, I think it was Tommy Hilfiger, who he couldn't get his jeans to sell. And so he went into some of like the inner city in Harlem and started putting them outside of shops in just like places that literally you could not not get stolen. Yeah. And all of the inner city kids started stealing his jeans. And all of a sudden... Tommy Hilfiger exploded as a company. And I think it was Tommy Hilfiger, so don't quote me on that. But but literally, because if, if it's something that people want, you have to get it in their hands for the word of mouth. And I really think that giving it away yeah. was the secret to how I sold 65,000 copies. Because I, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands I gave away, but it was very many. I mean, I, I, would, I had it posted in different Reddit groups, just the PDF, and it wasn't even giving it away in exchange for an email address. I mean, it was okay. literally just posting it in different places. Literally, Anna Grace, amazing heart, just wanting to change people's lives and committed and said, like, I just might even have to give this away in order to change people's lives. Is that really where it was coming from? Yeah, this was never a business for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it has obviously become so, and now I'm thrilled to be able to be doing it full time, but yeah. it was very much like, yeah, I want to help people stop drinking. And I think that's really why um, traffic hasn't been, it's never really been an issue for me is because it was so much from a place of just, you know, really wanting people to have the information above all I mean, else. And that in itself is an amazing lesson for any entrepreneur, like bringing your heart into this business before it was even a business, but bringing your heart, just being Annie, coming from a place of authenticity and, and true intention of helping people. This is what I'm hearing for myself. Like that, that was a massive jump start to this whole business. And honestly, it's not just a business, like you have created a massive movement. Yeah, it's really become something just awesome, which is so cool. And it just continues to grow. We just launched a, literally two days ago, um, the Naked Mind, this Naked Mind Institute, which is a coaching certification program for people to learn the method and be able to teach it. So it's really exciting. Jenny, I'm so excited for you. That's massive. So um, what I wanted to teach or share really was this core technique that um, I really honed in in my second book and it's called ACT and it's uh, you know the ACT technique and the okay. reason it works uh, and, and this technique I would say from especially from an entrepreneurial perspective it is so incredibly powerful because of all the all the beliefs that we that hold us back as entrepreneurs you know I'm, I'm sure you've heard it said that the company only grows as fast as the founder grows and they're not talking about the founder growing in height or width or revenue or house size they're talking about like the interpersonal growth of the founder yes. the, always the limited yeah yeah and so um any belief that you have, the thing is we, we have this mistaken idea that we need to like flagellate ourselves, that we need to beat ourselves up, that we need to push ourselves into more and more um, work. And, yeah. and if it feels bad, it must be good, you know, but actually those beliefs, when you really have things that are made, putting you in a negative space or putting you in a space that doesn't feel good, um, they really hinder your business, you know, and, and I think it's really interesting. And so the way that I describe where to use the act technique is I would say on anything that starts with should. I should be growing faster. I should have started a podcast already. I should be going live on Facebook five times a week. You know, I should be having more subscribers. My conversion rate should be better. And yeah, all those things sound really true on the surface. Sure. But the fact is like comparing, they, they bring us to a place where, uh, where we actually are like operating out of a bit of negativity. And so yeah. this, this yeah. technique can really help with that. Um, by the way, it helps people stop, stop eating sugar and all that other stuff. Totally. Can even the phrase, I shouldn't do this thing and I shouldn't be going with, like, is that also interchangeable with this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because all of those things, you know, uh, you know, I shouldn't sleep in. Somebody had a ma major breakthrough with that. Like I should be sleeping in so much in the morning. And, and it isn't as much that 
this is going to give you permission to be like a fat, lazy person on the couch. It's more that it, it really relieves um, when you relieve the negativity and the inner pressure, then ironically, you are so much in a better headspace to go after what you want and the things you think you should be doing start to happen. And so it's kind of this um, oxymoron in a, in a way. But how the, how the, why the technique works, just really briefly, and then I'll, I'll give you the steps, is you know when you first touched a flame, right? Like imagine a candle and there's a little baby and she's one years old and she walks up to it and it's beautiful and it's orange and, and you know, green. And it's like, oh my gosh, I want to touch that. And she reaches out and she touches it and it hurts. And it, once you know fire hurts, you never, ever, ever have to consciously think about not touching that candle ever. Like it's, it's done, it's dusted. There's no conscious thought into that ever. You never have to consciously avoid touching fire. And that's because the subconscious mind like desperately wants to protect you and avoid pain. And so when you reveal to your mind very consciously through this process that certain things are hurting you and holding you back, the subconscious mind lets go of those thought patterns and lets go of those beliefs. So um, we could use this for, you know, I, my business should be growing faster. And the process is this, A-C-T. So A is awareness. And that's just stating whatever belief you're going to use it on. So my business should be growing faster. And the A is so cool because um, you just state it. But as you work through it, you start to see other things that surface. You start to see other beliefs that hold you back. And so when you first start something like this, you might have a whole journal of things that you're like, oh, I'm going to do it on this one and this one and this one, because the feeling on the other side is so much peace and freedom that you're like, oh yeah, I want to do this on all these things because it just gives you a really good um, headspace. So you just write down, I should be growing faster. And then step two is C for clarity. And clarity really comes in a few parts. So the first one is like, where did it come from? And that's just two seconds. Like, why do I have this belief? Is it because I'm in this mastermind where everybody else's business seems to be exploding? Is it because okay. I'm you know, comparing myself to my neighbor? Is it because I've, I have this financial pressure? Like, why do I have this belief anyway? And um, then the second part of C is, is really doing that candle and flame thing. So this is where you say, okay, how does this make me feel? When I wake up in the morning and I have the first feeling, the first thing I think is, oh, I should be growing faster. I should be doing more. How does that make you feel? How do you approach your day? Do you get scrunchy? Do you get tight? Do you get uncomfortable? Do you start snapping at your kids? Do you not even notice your kids because you're so focused on your phone and you're just rushing right into work? Do you... Yeah. Like, forego all of this other stuff like what happens as a result of that belief what are all the negative consequences and this is really where you show your subconscious how hurtful and toxic this belief is and then the second part of it is like how would i feel without it like what if i could couldn't what if i woke up and uh, i couldn't even think that i woke up and i just was perfectly happy with my rate of growth like my business is my business. I'm just stoked to be in it. Like there's no pressure. How would that feel? How would I approach my day? How would I treat my clients? How would I show up for my family? How would I, you know, treat the Facebook lives without that pressure, without that noise? And again, that's just showing the subconscious how much less painful that alternative could be. And then the third step is T for turnaround. And the T is like really where the magic happens. And the T can be hard. You have to dig deep sometimes. Um, but T is just saying, okay, what's the opposite of that belief? So I shouldn't be growing any faster. And at first you're like, well, no, that's not true. Every business should be growing faster. Oh my gosh, of course I should be growing faster. And you get quiet and you say, okay, let me really dig deep and let me see if I can come up with ways that this alternative could be as true or true. And so you dig deep and you say, okay, well, what if I grew, what if there was huge market demand and then my inventory ran out and then I got a ton of really negative reviews? Like, what if I couldn't handle the growth, you know? Or what if I grew faster and it taxed me so much on a personal level that my marriage fell apart? You know, what if me not growing faster is actually in my marriage? You know, what if me not growing faster is meaning that I'm showing up for my kids' baseball games? And because of that, my kid's going to go on to do like incredible things instead of going on to, you know, do really nasty things. Like, what are all the reasons that I shouldn't be growing faster? And then that's it. You just let it go. And I think that's the thing that's really magic about it. I mean, some people say like they want to be so honest with themselves on this piece of paper that they throw it away. They burn it, whatever. Um, you can do whatever you want. It's not even to read again. It's just because now 
when you wake up tomorrow and if you have that thought, I should be going faster, number one, you probably won't have it. Number two, if you have it, you'll be like, oh no, I shouldn't. And you'll feel so much peace. And it's just this really incredible process and technique. And um, I wanted to just do one more uh, related to food because I know that that's one that just really like hurts people, me, me too. And I feel like we get ourselves really stuck, especially sure. if about food and eating. And, and so- Wait, what? first of all, I just have to say, act that was awesome and amazing you like the way you described it and helped me take it on that was awesome um just i think even taking a moment to be aware of these thoughts and how they're making us feel it's something that we're not taught from a young age and in fact like a lot of times we don't even talk about feelings and emotions and so we just feel like we have to hide all of this and so just simply taking that moment to uh, recognize that thought and recognize how it's it's making us feel super powerful and then the turnaround the opposite I love this thank you so much for sharing that super oh, I'm so glad I'm so glad yeah, yeah I, I, I love it so much and I feel like um and I know uh, you know a lot of your like this audience might not be interested in alcohol but if you are um, it is like in the end of my book it's the whole technique is like detailed out too so okay. cool. if somebody wanted more um, but that's it that's it so you cool. that's cool. with your your alcohol challenge right yeah it's a 30 day alcohol free challenge in this book and that's the technique that is used throughout the whole thing which is awesome yeah. Um, but yeah so doing it you know for food like one of my things that really really got me stuck is Man, every time, and my kids, I have three kids and like so many birthday parties. I'm sure you can relate. And every time we go to a birthday party, like if I, party. Quandary, I did have the cake and feel bad about it later or beat myself up or feel like, oh, why am I doing this? I know I don't even like it or enjoy it. It's not making me feel good. Or I didn't have the cake and I feel totally deprived. And I'm like, oh, everybody else is having the cake and I'm not having the cake and yes. poor me. And so one day, um, I was walking through the grocery store and I just noticed that I can walk through the entire bakery aisle and have no craving for cake. I can see way more cakes than there is at one birthday party with way more frosting and way more Oreos and everything. And I have no craving for cake. I do not crave cake every time I walk into the supermarket. But yeah. birthday party, I completely crave cake. So yeah. it's like, what is like, what is the belief that's underlying this craving? And so, um, one of the beliefs is that, oh, okay, well, why is it important at a birthday party? Because cake at a birthday party means inclusion. It means celebration. It means reward. It means like, well done, you've made it another year. We're like rewarding ourselves. We're celebrating with that. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So let me apply the, apply the ACT technique to that. Okay. And so obviously awareness, like food is, food is reward right? And you can see this so many places besides a birthday party. And you yeah. say, Claire, okay, where, where did that come from? You know? Um, and I, I mean, I don't know about you, but in our my kindergarten, good behavior was rewarded with a popsicle or a sucker or a piece of gum, right? And um, birthday parties have been around, like food has always been a reward, right? Yeah. And so, um, or you can say, you know, food is a, a celebration. It really brings people together and and I'm not going to feel part of it. And that's, again, yeah. it seems to be true. But when you look at it, you can then take it or leave it, which is so beautiful. So um, yeah. and how does that make me feel? Like if I'm, if I'm sitting at and I'm not going to let myself have the cake and I believe that having the cake is being part of this group and part of this tribe and part of the celebration, yeah. then how does that make me feel? It makes me feel outside of it all. It makes yeah. me feel other. It makes me feel else. That's not nice, right? But what if that's not true? What if I what if I didn't see it like that? What if I saw that cake as I saw this cakes in the grocery store? I don't feel like I'm missing out when I walk by those cakes. Oh, that's interesting. And then say so you go to the turnaround and the turnaround is really just, okay, food is not reward. You know, food isn't um, tribe, like part of the tribe. I'm not going to be missing out if I don't have it. And I say, okay, how is that true? Like, all right, it feels rewarding for the first three minutes I stuff the cake in my face. But then how do I feel an hour later? You know, how do I feel a few hours later? How do I feel the next day? And by the way, did I actually reward my body? Like, was that buttercream frosting and high fructose corn syrup and artificial dyes? Like, was that rewarding to me? No, it wasn't, right? And so it's like, oh. And then, by the way, you let it go. So that's the most important part. Even if you do this yeah. at a birthday party and you walk back in, you eat the cake. Fine. Totally fine. <laughs> 
It's about the next time and it's about how it influences your subconscious because what you don't want to do is you don't want to go head to head with these internal beliefs. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get into a willpower battle. You don't want to get into this I'm, because that therein comes the sense of deprivation, this forbidden fruit. And that's, that's not, that's never served us over the long term. We, that's why our diet culture is up and down. That's why it's such a mess. We have to get to a point of like peace about this. So you just do the work on it. You let yeah. it go. And then you just notice next time you're at a birthday party, you know, is that craving diminished? And my bet is like, certainly from my experience and many thousands of other people is it will be. And, um, and obviously that's the exact technique that we work through all the beliefs around alcohol in, in both of my books, but it really does apply to anything, anything that's holding you back. Well, I'm sure there's somebody else out there who struggles with eating too much sugar because I don't know. Just kidding. Um, Annie, like this is like every person on planet Earth, especially in an abundant place like the United States, where, like you said, it's like treats and candy and cake and cupcake is the reward to the point that it's no longer a treat. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just expected everywhere. And this this process of going through the act method and understanding what's motivating me, what's driving me to feel like I have to do this, that. If I don't, I'll be deprived. It's amazing how when we empower ourselves to make an informed decision, and like you said, like feeding this to our subconscious, how it like breaks down those barriers of feeling forced into this decision or being deprived because I've got to do this thing because I've got to be healthy for all these reasons, whatever they are. And like the power of putting ourselves into a positive motivated healthy state and how just naturally out of that we make these good and healthy decisions that serve us right and that put us in a place to then like mike was telling us like he suddenly had so much clarity on his business because he had cut out the alcohol and the same is true for sugar and and just eating the wrong kinds of foods it can put our mind in a certain state as well and the power of doing these things and, and then coming from a place of clarity and making informed decisions and doing it in a way that is just so much easier than battling ourselves, like you said. So beautiful. Annie, thank you so much for sharing that framework, um, your story. And I want to know, like, if you're open to it, transition into you are creating an amazing movement that is super powerful and it is impacting not just the people who are part of your community, but I'm sure their spouses, their kids, their coworkers. Tell me like what, it, like I know you have done a lot of things to make this be what it is right now today. So what are some things that you would say to somebody who has maybe a similar story in that they had a personal experience. It totally transformed their life. They feel called to send and share this message with the world. But they don't even know where to start. What would you say to somebody like that who is wanting to create a movement? What are kind of some of the principles they need to understand and things that they can do to begin moving in that direction? The things that really helped me, especially at the beginning, um, were first of all, really recognizing and understanding that you know, nothing is new. And I know like it sounds like, yes, I came up with the ACT technique, but it's it's based on and founded on, you know, like literally thousands of year old, like different philosophers and different yeah. you know, people. And, and, and so nothing is actually new, but it's you that's new. It's wow. your story that's new. It's your experience that's new. It's your words that's new. It's the fact that you are going to show your face and somebody's going to see themselves reflected in you. And I think that's so important because so often we say, oh my gosh, I learned something maybe at this Tony Robbins event or maybe at, like yeah. whatever. And, and it's so impactful to me and I want to share it, but it's not new. It's not mine. It's, but it is yours because it's through you, because you're the vessel, because you're the medium. Mm. And so if you think of yourself as the medium and the paint and like the message, yeah, so it might have been said a thousand times before. So has everything else on the entire planet. So if you if you are sitting there waiting because you feel like, oh, well, you know, what I what I have to share, it's been done before or it's been done yeah. better. Like yeah. I just 
really encourage you to, to squish that belief. And I feel like that really helped me because, you know, what I learned, I obviously learned from a lot of different sources and different people, but, you know, nobody had brought it in the way that I brought it. Nobody will bring it in the way that you bring it. And so I'd really like just encourage people to not feel that way. Um, the other Did thing you that- you any of that in the beginning yourself? The like, oh. I'm just me? Yes, for sure. I mean, that's that's why I bring it up is because it was so it was such a thing for me that I mean, I didn't even want to like I was like, yeah, OK, I wrote these journals, but like I didn't intend to make it a book. I didn't intend to make it like now I have a podcast. Now I have like a coaching program. Now I have the Naked Man Institute. Like none of that was intentional, um, but it was really. But at first it was really that that belief that, well, you know, I, I just learned from all these other people, yeah. you know, who am I? And I yeah. think it really almost, we all know the imposter syndrome, but I think the yeah. imposter syndrome can very much come from this belief that we have to be original. And um, I love how Liz Gilbert describes this in Big Magic. She says, you're never gonna be original. So just get that out of your head, um, <laughs> but you can be authentic. Mm. And that's such a difference. And people are attracted to you because you're you and because you're authentic and you're totally enough. And I think I was really like, well, I'm not a doctor. I'm, yeah. I'm not a, a, you know, I'm not a counselor. I'm not an addictionologist. Like who, who am I to do this? And I think that was really a big growth thing for me, um, especially in the early days. So yeah, yeah that's absolutely why I share it. And I, I, I'd, I'd offered something else too, that really helped me so much. Um, and it's just this idea, especially if you're in the business, and I think we all are to some degree in the business of helping people, whether it's helping them with their businesses or helping them with their strategy or helping them with like a, a personal thing like alcohol or, or habit change or food or diet, whatever it is, is um, it can be so tempting to look at yourself as a savior. And I think that's our default mode is we feel like, okay, if I share this with somebody and they're not successful with it, that's on me. You know, if I share this and, and it can be a lot of fear to share it because well, what sure. if it doesn't work for everybody? What if it doesn't work for anybody? What if it like doesn't happen the way it happened for me? Yeah. And um, somebody really freed me of that. He's on my team actually, uh, his name is DeAndre. And he told me early days, he said, look, you know, you're, you're not the boat. Like you just brought people to a boat. And by the way, there's tons of boats on the shore. You're just yeah. showing the boat that worked for you. That's all you're doing is you're saying, look, you want to get across the shore. This boat worked for me. Like that's what a beautiful a analogy. I've never heard it described that way. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it's so it's great. Great. I look at it that way. And then um, Garrett White, a few years ago at Funnel Hacking Live, he said, just remember you're you're a leader, not a savior. And I was like, oh, yes, that's like exactly what I needed to hear is just free free myself and free yourself from from the out from anybody's outcome. If you free yourself from anybody's outcome, it's all gravy. Because you really, you know, um, if you're doing stuff to like help people and you're so tied up in their outcome, yes, you actually defeat the purpose. Yeah. If you're doing something because you had a you had a a change in your heart and you had a change in your life and you want to share that change like that is such an authentic again place to be and then you really you're not dependent for your for you get up the next day like the, the problem with tying your self-worth to somebody else's outcome is number one you have no control over it and yeah. number two if, if something negative happens like it will it will if you do anything worth doing sure. obviously haters um then you're not going to get up the next day and keep doing it. And so the people that actually need you to keep doing it aren't going to find you because you're going to stop before you really have a chance. So, you know, really freeing yourself from put it out in the world and like, let it go, hold it lightly. And I think that's really, really helped me a lot. So powerful. And I feel like I've seen some of that because we've known each other for about two years now. And I've seen you go through some of that. And I think it's so beautiful that you're, being so real and authentic and sharing with people. Yeah, I had those doubts and those fears myself. And here's how I have learned to overcome that and confront that. And and just like an act, turn it around to the point that it's freeing you and it's no longer, you're no longer trapped by those doubts and those fears. That's beautiful. Annie, I've got to, as, as a woman, a mother of four myself, I've got to hear, how do you are how are you managing because your kids are pretty young how do you manage your workflow and motherhood yeah um so i have a one-year-old a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old so yeah they're very young and 
um, <laughs> I get a lot of help. And I think that's, that's really it. I had an incredible, um, I forget who it was. It was someone we, the both of us know though. And he framed something out for me and it, I'll share it because it was so powerful in my life. But he basically said, what I want you to do is quantify your time in dollars. And I'd never done that before. And I think as especially a woman and an entrepreneur, yes. like, but I have more time, but I have more time, but I have more time. And, um, and by the way, like, I think it's really hard for us to give up things like dishes and laundry and grocery shopping and um, house cleaning and, you know, making doctor's appointments, all the things that seem to make us moms, like yes. that's is really hard to give up because it yeah. feels like we define it, you know, as yeah. this makes me a good mom. If I'm, you know, and it's not that I'm not at the doctor's appointment, by the way, I am at the doctor's appointment. I just don't schedule the doctor's appointment. Love it. And, love it. <laughs> and like even the volunteer stuff, right? Like, and so, but once you did that, once you did that exercise and you realize, oh my gosh, my time in terms of dollars per hour is worth, you know, whatever it is, say it's like, I don't know, a few hundred dollars an hour and I can hire this out for 10 to $15 an hour. Like, then you should be doing that all day long. And really another part of that was that I had somebody say, make a, you know, get a piece of paper, draw a line right through the middle of it. And on one side, put everything that drains your energy. And on the other side, put everything that gives you energy and then commit yeah. to yourself that no matter what the cost every month, you're going to get two things off that energy draining list and put it into the, um, give it to somebody else, no matter how much it costs, even if it's not profitable. Because I, I think, again, as entrepreneurs, we can be like, but the ROI on that doesn't work, you know? And but that doesn't matter because the ROI on you having more energy to show up for the things you love to do, you know, like this interview, for instance, is huge. Like, I'm going to have lots of energy just from talking to you, Katie. And so it's like, I'll take that forward. Whereas um, if I was doing something like I don't know. For me personally, it's like looking at analytics, like that's going to take my energy way down. So I think that, you know, from a, from a personal perspective, just realizing the worth of your time. And yeah. then by the way, what you get to do with the time you have is, you know, from four till six or whatever it is, you're just with your kids, or maybe it's like whatever time it is for you. And you're not doing the dishes. You're not doing one more load of laundry. You're not, do you're doing what they want to do, whether it's like, yeah you know, being outside or, oh, I don't know, playing video games, whatever it is, um, you're actually spending really quality time with them. And then on the on the business side, you know, really delegating the things that drain your energy, understanding that the, the investment into that is so much more powerful than dollars um, yeah. because it actually allows you to, if you are doing things that give you energy, then time becomes like a non-issue. It's almost like time is bendable, right? So. Mm. Annie, that is so good because I've always heard it described you know, listing out the value according to all of the things that you're doing and then buying back your time at a discount, which is awesome. But you've taken it a whole to a whole nother level and said, like, what actually energizes you and fuels you and drives you and focusing on that, not just not just being motivated by the dollar amounts attached to it, which is um, like at the end of the day, I'm only going to do what I feel like doing right in my business at home. And when I spend my time and my attention doing things that drain me. Then when I walk back into the house and I try to be present with my family, like I'm shot. <laughs> doesn't matter how much money's in my pocket, I'm shot. And I like me, mommy shows up and it just doesn't work. And I love this approach of really focusing on what's giving me energy, what's taking energy. And then really over, you know, time moving the things that take away the energy off your plate. That's absolutely love it and i just have to say like i love having this conversation because my, like as an a young mom entrepreneur I, I felt so much guilt and like you were saying like my my role as a woman is defined as being the mom doing the laundry doing the dishes cooking all the meals from scratch grinding the wheat like it was kind of ridiculous the levels that i was going to and and noticing how like i thought if my kids were not within eye shot at all times and I was not being a mom and having to rewrite that story and using different tools, but similar to act and saying like, okay, but how do you feel when you are doing that? And how does it make you show up? And what would it be like if you showed up happy? <laughs> and like, I, I just, I want any woman who watching this, like Annie, you're such a shining example of this. Like 
there probably are times when your kids are being watched by somebody else, but when you are spending time with them, you're super present with them. Like you're engaged, you have energy for them. You're happy. You're like not just telling them no, 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 no. And not to say that those kinds of things don't show up too, but I think it's so powerful for women, especially in today's day where we live in the most amazing time in the history of the world where specifically as a woman, as a mother, the ability to create a movement like you have and impact lives is is like all we need is this. We yeah. have this and we have the motivation and the drive and the intention intention and like like you've done, created the amazing habits and set up your life, but it is absolutely possible to create impact, not just in your home, but in the world. And like everything that you're sharing is just like, it's all the pieces of what any woman or man needs to create that kind of life and impact within our home and in the world. So Annie, like huge high fives, big hug. They, like this is amazing for me personally. Um, having all those insights into how we can take control of our thoughts and kind of rewrite the script to our subconscious to take the actions and live the kind of life that we want to live and not that we just feel like doing or not doing right and thank you so much for just sharing that piece of your business and how you're growing this movement and the things that you're doing and kind of the stories that you were having to destroy personally in order to get yourself in a place where you can be in conversation with all of these people Thank oh, you. you're so welcome. So and I'll, I'll say one more quick thing that just popped into my mind. I just started doing it recently. But it. Kind of time with your kids. So I've been doing this kind of media tour since the um, yes. second book came out in January. Yeah. And I've started bringing my kid, like one kid at a time. Love so um, like I went to Phoenix and I did a morning TV show and I brought, you know, my seven-year-old and I'm going next week to Chicago to do two TV shows and I'm bringing my 10-year-old and it's just so much incredible quality time. And what are you doing? You're in the, they think it's amazing. You're just in the Uber and the airport. And, and by the way, then I'm not alone. So like I get all this energy added to me. I feel so much happier. And I'm yeah. like, okay, the price of a plane ticket like is so worth it because of how you know, the gift it gives them and the gift it gives yeah. me. Um, so anyway, I've just started just thinking outside the box in that way. And I think it's really been helpful. That is awesome and so inspiring. Annie, I want to know something that you do consistently every day. I really feel like if I can see that thing, whatever that is, then I can I can get to know you even more. Um, well, I pray every day <laughs> for right. sure. Um, but I think also, and I... I definitely, whether it's just in moments for like the smell that it is outside or really intentionally, which I try to be more intentional about it, but I definitely like have a very strong like gratitude practice. And, you know, my son and I last night at bedtime, he was feeling a little bit weird and I was like, you know, a trick. And we just started going through all the things, like grateful for his blankets and grateful for his stuffy and grateful for his bed. And Aww. it's like, that makes you feel so much better, mom. And I'm like, yeah, it's like magic, you know, like if you're ever really down and you can just, even if it's being grateful for the chair that's holding you up because you don't have to stand and you're not like, um, that it's just, it's so cliche, but it's been really, really powerful for me for sure. It is. Thank you. It's just one of those foundational things that so often we miss because life gets noisy and busy and having that conscious thought, I'm going to shift my thinking from this negativity to being grateful. It's such a powerful tool, such a powerful tool. And just hearing that you are sharing that with your son. So awesome. Hey, thank you so much. If somebody is wanting to stay in touch with you, what's the best way to be a part of your world, be a part of this movement, get your books? So um, we have a free 30-day challenge that just follows this book that's always available at alcoholexperiment.com. So if that is like what you're interested in, and then I have this Naked Mind podcast, which is also great. We're almost at 2 million downloads, which is very cool. So, so it is just going cool, crazy. So yeah. cool. And you have a lot of fans here. I have to just give a shout out to everybody who's been commenting on here. We've got Jennifer Sewell. Hello, Jennifer. Um, Carla White, hello, Jared Prince, Mirza Ali, um, AJ Rivera, who we, I was just talking to before our conversation, and of course, the awesome and amazing Liz Benny. So awesome to have you guys watching. Make sure that you like this interview, that you share it with your community. What Annie has to share is like, I'm often telling entrepreneurs, if you're feeling stuck, 
it's probably not that you need another course or need another training or that you need to learn some new technique. Oftentimes when we reach that point as entrepreneurs, it's our own personal capacity that Annie was talking about and what you have shared today is so simple. Like I love that you broke it down to three letters, ACT. So simple yet so profound and helping us to break past those ceilings, those barriers, break out of the darkness and begin to experience some really radical movement, motion, transformation, both personally, like Annie so specifically is speaking to, and even in our business and our life. And like, Annie, I think it's so cool that you are speaking to such a niche down um, topic world, specifically speaking to people who are dealing with alcohol. I'm sure it's a very um, consistent problem that doesn't go away. And yet at the same time, like you're using principles that work for anybody and everybody. So Annie, thank you again so much. This was an amazing interview and just really appreciate you and everything that you're doing and for coming here and sharing your awesomeness with us. So thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. It's such a pleasure. Okay. See you guys. Let me ask you a question. What is better than change? <laughs> Lasting change, of course. And if you've had trouble making change stick, either with alcohol or in any other area of your life, you are in for a treat. I created the 100 Days of Lasting Change to ensure that we don't just change for a moment, but we truly transform for a lifetime. And this program is so close to my heart. Thousands of people have been through it and their results are incredible. But don't take my word for it. Check it out at thisnakedmind.com forward slash 100 days. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.